this event has had many learnings. At the beginning, I did promise you that the speakers we're going to bring to the stage are going to give you the tools and the insights to cross that bridge from where you are to where you want to be. Do you feel like we're on the track to doing that for you? Yes. Awesome. The final talk we're going to have is a talk we've all been waiting for. It's a talk that's going to top it all off, that's going to seal the deal for everyone in this room today. It's the most highly anticipated talk of the event, a talk that is sure to inspire us all because it's a talk by the youngest billionaire in the continent, as per the Forbes 2019, the Forbes Africa uh, list of African billionaires. Mohamed Duji is not just a trailblazer in East Africa, in, in specifically in Tanzania, the country that he comes from, but it's a shining light for the entire continent, proving that hard work, that heart, soul, passion, not just for business, but for people, creates results that are multiplied. Now, he is also a humble man. If you've checked out his videos on YouTube, you've seen that he has a heart for people. He's offered to take a few questions from the audience as soon as his talk is done. So start thinking about those questions, but also post them on the app. I'm going to be choosing one of the most potent questions that I can find on the app, and I'm going to be posing that question to him. Of course, we're only going to take a limited amount of questions, so do start thinking about those as you're listening to his talk. Also, he has come all the way from Tanzania to deliver this talk today. So as we watch his intro video, I want us to give him all the love, all the meet-up cheers, all the applause that we have left in us. It is our final talk of the day in any case. And let's roll the video. Mohamed Duji, president of Metal Group. Africa's youngest billionaire. Mohammed is a businessman, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and former politician, and Africa's youngest billionaire. In 2019, Forbes magazine listed him as the 14th richest person in Africa, with an estimated net worth of 1.9 billion US dollars. Mohammed Duji was also the first Tanzanian billionaire on the cover of Forbes Africa magazine in 2013. Before we open the floor and take questions from the floor, I'm going to kick off with a, with a question from social media. Right. And the question is around this phenomenon of manufacturing. Yeah. Um, the person is asking um, about this issue of uh, the East and the West coming into Africa, taking raw materials, producing all these products that they then come back and sell into Africa. And as an industrialist yourself, um, you know, how do you think young people can begin to navigate the issue of manufacturing our own products? But also, what are the policies that you think are hindering that kind of uh, manufacturing growth in Africa? And how do we address those issues, especially politically? Yes, so I'll, I'll give you an example of a specific industry, I mean, uh, that creates large number of jobs. We all know that whether if you look at Ivory Coast and you look at cocoa beans, and then you see the total amount of chocolates that are sold all over the world and the mm. value that is attached to it. And you see what Ivory Coast is actually getting out mm. is only 5% of the total value, one. Or you see a lot of cotton being grown into mm. Burkina Faso, or if you look at countries like Mozambique and Tanzania and Uganda. And yet what we do is we just export raw cotton so what doesn't make sense to me is that we have cotton, we have uh, quite competitive labor, yes. we have power that is not as competitive, but compared to China and India, which are the largest textile producers, uh, we are quite competitive to them. So what doesn't make sense, you take cotton, they go and spin and they weave and they process and then they print and then they come and dump these products into Africa. Uh, and so the jobs are being exported, mm. our raw material has been exported, the value addition has been exported, and how can they be competitive to bring it all the way back with all the freights of going and coming? Mm. So I took this, these challenges. So, so I think coming back to you know, uh, customs and coming back to revenue authorities, I think it is very, very important to protect manufacturing, and the only way to protect manufacturing uh, it's like, you know, how Donald Trump talks mm -hmm. about America first. You need to be, 
you know, having a priority for Africa first. So protect your industries from outside or subsidized products that come in and are dumped mm. and that affect your, your market. Mm. Thank you so much for that. I'm now going to take hands from the audience. I have one hand here. Do we have any other hands for this round? Please just raise them high because the lighting is pretty bright from stage. I have the second hand. Do we have a third hand? I'm not sure if I'm missing any hands, so if anyone can just tell me, okay, there. So we have our hand here. So, uh, Mike, where, where's our mic? So if you can just start here in the front. Thank you, and then we're going to go over to this end. Hello, hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Tammy Bowe. I'm a business partner to Brucey and um, her part-time bodyguard. Um, <laughs> so. So here, my question is this. So as an industrialist um, in Africa, I think, you know, we, we always talk about like the phenomenon of the fourth industrial revolution and what it really means is um, how automation um, is, is going to start to rapidly take over jobs. And working in industry means that so many people are dependent on the jobs that exist within that sector. And I think jobs are most threatened in your sector more than any other sector in Africa, really, especially in this continent. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you have to make, um, you know, way ups between implementing, um, you know, aut automation machinery that could perhaps maybe we assume will help you bolster your profits at the expense of people's jobs? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you were confronted with those kind of conundrums? And how do you navigate those kinds of things, especially in a situation where we would feel a developmental imperative to people having jobs here in our continent? Okay. Thank you. Thank I you think a uh, very, very fair question. I think uh, this is an issue, uh, but I, as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. uh, you must have heard about impact investing. And, you know, I believe I'm an impact investor. I believe that by investing, I need to make profits. But at the same time, I think I need to do good also. Mm -hmm. So it's not all about the profits, number one. And number two, what is happening is that countries that are mainly affected by robotics are countries where labor is very, very expensive. Now, if you look at, I still believe in Africa, I mean, you look at the East African economies, you're talking about GDP of 50, 55 billion, you're talking about 50, 55 million, you're talking about $1,000 a year per capita. So you're talking about $85. So, so you're still very, very competitive. But three, what we should do is that we need to build capacity uh, for that labor force to do something that robotics cannot do. And then you have those jobs that are repetitive, that need consistency, then you can automate, but not uh, uh, by giving up jobs. This mm. is my belief. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Our second question here in the front. Um, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Oluetu, good day Mr. Doji. Um, um, thank you for um, sharing with us how you, as a Pan-Africanist, make a difference in the lives of um, the con sorry, in, in, in make a difference in the continent and the lives of African people. May the African gods continue to bless you and increase your business. Um, I would like to find out from you, as, personally as an entrepreneur, um, where do entrepreneurs or where should entrepreneurs park their um, liquid assets? Firstly, to ensure that they have a fail safe um, and also for, I guess, for the future, you know, for um, being able to, to um, pass that on um, for the future generations. Because we'd assume that if you have so much money in your bank, you'd like to make it sit there and then look at the zeros, you know, once mm -hmm. in a while. But like, where do you park your, 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 your liquid assets? You know, your, your mm. cash. Yeah. Thank you. So, so th thank you for, for your positive comments. Um, to be very honest, I just before I respond to that question, that, uh, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, it's very, very important to do all this impact investing and make sure that at the end of the day, it's not only about the money, and it's about the people. I'll give you a small example of what happened to me recently where I was kidnapped. And... Uh, it's very, it's very funny. What happened, it was nine days, and uh, majority of people in my country are very poor people. And there are differences of political affiliation, there are differences of religion, there are differences of color, the differences of tribes. But the biggest difference 
in Africa and in the world is between the haves and the have-nots. Mm. So uh, when I was abducted and I was away for nine days, and when I came back and I saw what was happening in the social media and I saw what, how Africans and poor Africans stood up for me in terms of praying, hashtags, bring back more. I mean, this really, really, really touched me. Because how do you expect a poor person to think about a rich person's problems? Mm. And, and, and I was very, very surprised because the problem is between the haves and the have-nots. So I think it is very, very important in our careers uh, like the speaker before, you know, spoke that life is very, very short, and, and I think it is important uh, to always give back to our communities, specific communities. Coming back to your question, I think, you know, uh, old-fashioned bankers will always tell you to have 30, 35 percent of your money in very liquid, liquid cash assets, and then other 30, 35 percent so-called brick and mortar, and other in gold. And now with all the problems that we're having in the world, I see gold prices are also going up. But my, my, my idea, I think the world and Africa is moving to fintech. Mm. You know, I think the world is changing like crazy. And I think if, if you can come up with an idea of a startup that is related to technology and connecting people, I just feel that there's just a lot of money to be made there. Mm. Thank you so much for that. And then we had a question, I think, was the question in the this middle? Side. This side. Oh, it's yeah. with the white, okay. Right. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Nambumela Lodugwe. And my question is that you have all the success and I think everybody in this room wants that. We're here because of that. But I want to know who is Muhammad? Like, who are you really? So, <laughs> fair like, question. With, with, with 100 hours a week, $85 million a year, let's take that away. Yes. Who are you really? What is your dogma? Like, what is inside? Fair, fair question. So, so Muhammad uh, is an African boy uh, that was born in the hinterlands of Tanzania. Uh, from a small place called Singida. Uh, I was second, uh, and uh, you know, I never made it to the hospital. I imagine my dad was so crazy that he took a risk. I was born at home with the midwife, and it took my mother 18 hours, and uh, they didn't even know there were no ultrasounds then. Mm -hmm. And there was an umbilical cord that was around my neck, and that's why I wasn't coming out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the hospital was about 50, 60 miles away, but the, the road uh, to the hospital was so terrible. And, you know, it got to a point where, you know, they, they thought that one of us was going to die, or both of us. So my life started from a, a, a very small town in Tanzania. And, uh, yes, I, I went to, I did high school, and then I went to university in D.C., when I came back, I, I also joined politics, and I was a member of parliament for 10 years. Uh, and it was very, very, you know, usually uh, uh, to get into politics at that young age was very, very difficult. But the reason why I got into politics was, and I want to share this small story with you. So Singida is an urban constituency, but when you drive 10 kilometers out of Singida, you, the periphery is rural. And when I, we have about 100,000 people in, in, in town, and then you've got another 100,000 people in rural Singida. So when I drove, I saw an old man. At that time, there was a puddle of yellow water, and he was basically had a, a plate, and he would scoop this water and put it into, uh, into the bucket. And I asked him, so what are you doing? And because my grandfather and my great-grandfather, mm -hmm. they're all buried in Singida. And as, as Muslims, we kind of go back to the graveyard and pray for them. And so, so when I saw this old man, and he says, no, 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 this is the water we're drinking. So I, I asked them that, who's your member of parliament? And funnily, they said the member of parliament was the minister of water at that time. Uh, when I started researching, I realized, you know, three out of ten kids die from waterborne diseases because of typhoid, exactly, mm. et cetera, et cetera. And then the problem is the education level was so low, so, you know, it was a vicious 
uh, circle that they were not very educated and therefore when the kids got sick, they started treating them, uh, not medically, but treating them in their own, you know, uh, uh, informal ways. And when the kid got really, really sick, by the time they got the kid to the hospital, many kids died. And you know, I, I have children and I say that I love my children and I know every parent loves their child the way I love mine. And I always say that a child from New York or, you know, from Tokyo, eh, his or her life equals to a child in Africa because, you know, there is no life that is greater than another life. Life equals to life. So, so that prompted me to get into politics. Mm. And I wasn't a very good MP because I was not representing the constituency much in parliament because I felt I was a little conflicted because of the businesses that I was running, but I had a very strong team. I mean, on the education front, we had, imagine, two secondary schools, and in 10 years, we were up to 23. Accessibility of water was at 23%. When I left, it was almost 85, 86%, and this is according to the World Health Organization. So, I'm, Mo is the person of people. I like people. I, I, I feel wherever I can bring value to people or help people, mm. I believe that, you know, when God gives you wealth, that sometimes you're a representative uh, for the people and that, you know, this wealth. And that is why I've also signed the Giving Pledge. It's, it's mm. an initiative that is uh, from uh, the, the Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. Uh, where you pledge half of your wealth away. And I keep on telling my children that I'm really going to give majority of my wealth away uh, to, to philanthropy. And I think it's just, you know, so that's, that's more. And of course, I have a passion for football. I own uh, a club called Simba in Tanzania, which drives me crazy. It, uh, it increases my heart rate. I mean, I think, you know, there was a time when we were playing the Champions League and, you know, like 10 minutes before the game, I felt my hands are all numb. I'm like, dude, I'm going to die here, you know? <laughs> and I have no control. So, so this is more, a little bit of more. I mean, thank you so much for that. I don't know if you have time please, to take just please, two more questions, please, just please, one question here please, and please. one question from right here in the front row, unfortunately. And then maybe the third question, right at the, sort of the gray suit. So let's start right here. So if you could just stand up. So, yeah, just to, so that the person with the mic knows who you are. There we go. Uh, my name is Shiza Thompson. I'm from Malawi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you for elevating that 30 million to 1.1 billion. But uh, what I wanted to ask you is, uh, uh, I believe we have guys here that are starting from the scratch. They didn't have the opportunity to, to have that money to start their business. Mm. If it is in your case that uh, there was no that money, would you be a billionaire? And if your answer is yes, how would you advise the guys that are starting from the clutch that are here? Oh, good question. Um, so so def definitely, um, uh, I did have an advantage uh, that my father was uh, a rich man, reasonably a rich man, and that I got this fantastic education. I think capital is important. But I don't think I would have reached where I would have reached today if it wasn't for capital. And the time when I went back to Tanzania, the banking sector liberalization was delayed in East Africa. So I remember 1999, I walked into a Barclays Bank, and the paid up capital of Barclays Bank is $2 million, and the maximum they can lend me was 20% of the paid up capital, so it was $400,000. Mm. I realized that I was never gonna get anywhere with the 400,000. And so I started looking for solutions. And that is why I mentioned ethicalness your word. You know, even when you give your word, even if you're losing money, you make sure to, you adhere to your word. So I actually started coming to South Africa and knocking in doors and people, you know, uh, you know I, I, I could feel what they're saying, you know, look at this guy wearing a suit, talking big stories, you know, you know why should I lend him money, you know? But I kept on coming. And uh, finally, I broke through, I got a couple of million dollars, uh, I was lucky at the right time, at the right mm. place, with you know, interest rates being low, mm. and started off with a few million dollars, and now we have signed a quarter of a billion dollars of syndication. So yes, money makes money, but 
Specifically with only my father's wealth, I don't think I would have got where I would have got today. Uh, uh, you have to be able to access capital. And with today, I think, you know, uh, it is important uh, that, that, yes, you, once you have a fantastic idea and you're a fantastic executioner of that idea, I think there's many startups that are getting funded big time. Uh, I mean, startups that are losing money. In the past, when we were young, you go to someone and say, look, I have this business and I'm losing money and I, I, you know, I foresee losing it for five years and you invest in my money, he'll tell you to go to hell. You know? Today, you, know, you have these big startups. I think I was in the CEO conference and uh, I, I gave one of these awards to this company that is projecting to lose money for the next four or five years mm -hmm. and they're raising rounds and rounds of capital. So I think capital accessibility today is far more easier than you, but you just have to believe in your idea and you have to work hard and you have to keep on going at it. Okay, thank you so much for that response. We had a question right here at the front. And then the final question with the gentleman wearing a gray suit. So, Mo, uh, we know that you work 100 hours a week. You're always on a plane, uh, always busy managing these various businesses. Tell me, how do you stay in great shape? We know you have a six pack. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about your workout uh, routine and regimen. So, by the way, I got kidnapped at the gym. Huh? Um, it was 5 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, my dad was, when I was not there, this is the stories that my dad, and like, what does he do at the gym at 5 in the morning, right? It's crazy. So I, I think um, a healthy body is a healthy mind. I think it is very, very important. Uh, and you can go to the gym, you can run, but it's, you need to exercise, you need to sweat. You can even play sports, you know? Uh, it takes <laughs> your mind away from the real world, you can think, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it is very, very important. So what I do is that, that uh, I sacrifice my mornings. Uh, now I don't anymore, so I have picked the lunch time. Uh, and, and I make sure it is, you know, religious. Uh, that even if I'm feeling down, and many a times because I start so early, by the time it's 12, 1 o'clock, you've already clocked in seven, seven and a half hours. And when I go out to the gym and I come back and I run five, seven, eight kilometers every day and I work, I do light weights. I, I don't want to be a, what, a, a big guy, but, but I, I, <laughs> whenever I come out of the gym, I feel so good. I feel like I'm just like, you know, my, my, the new day has started, you know? So I always encourage. And you know, this, it's, it's very important that, that this habit has to be formed uh, from a young age, whether it is healthy eating or, you know, exercise, you need to do it from now. Don't think that, you know, yes, you have a high metabolism today, I don't need to, I'm okay, you know, when I'm 40, uh, and then you develop these bad habits and then you just never go to the gym. So for those that think, you know, you know, when you look at someone who's gained a lot of weight and you're like, you know, how the hell that happened? But let's look at it from a math perspective, right? I mean, if you gain one kilo, in a year, right? I mean, you won't notice it, right? Would you notice it? One kilo? No, right? Now imagine one times 15. Mm. <laughs> Serious business, eh? Mm. Okay. Thanks, Sid. <laughs> Thank you. Now, final question for the day. All right. Thank you, moderator. My name is Javier Makama. I'm representing the KBN Global Ambassador. So basically, I'm not a gentleman, so you know me now. I'm Javier Makama <laughs> from the Business Forum. <laughs> And it's so good to see you, my brother. I mean, we are part of our network as KBN. There are a few questions I want to ask you. Firstly, as you understand that Africa has signed the Africa Free Trade, which allows the access to market to trade among each other, and we're able to, as you're mentioning, that we don't have to export more of the materials, we can able to trade among ourselves. But there are two challenges regarding of the monopoly system. I mean, I'm listening to your presentation, like you said before, that you obviously control the whole value chain of the sectors that you're in. So how does the, I mean, the startups and the small businesses get you able to access the market if you are that big player that you almost control the whole value chain of the whole industries in Tanzania? And it's only a challenge to all the SMMEs that they're not able to have the access to market because they are super league players that absorb all these businesses, all the markets, and they don't able to open up a market. 
So how do you able as a business, as a uh, med, uh, to create mm. access to market to the small businesses? And the other question I want to ask, how is your business helping the entrepreneurship other than philanthropic? Because we believe entrepreneurship is literally a catalyst to really create an economy that can be sustainable. And as SMMS model really doesn't work. So that's the question I want to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I, I'll start with the third one in terms of what we do uh, to enhance entrepreneurship. Uh, what we have is called the More Entrepreneurs, uh, where we actually uh, ask people to come and present their startup ideas, and what we do is give them interest-free loans. So I actually spend my personal time to listening to these stories and making sure that these ideas are just not ideas and they, they can have a follow-up and they will be executed and they will be very successful. Mm -hmm. So I kind of deal with two things. One, I do a mentorship, but two, also I give them access to capital that is interest-free. Now, when you look at a country like Tanzania or Kenya where interest rates are high, you know, when you have no security or collateral or you have no credit history, you go in and they ask you to pay 20%, which is Shylock interest rates, uh, which gives a tough start for an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So this is my personal initiative through the Mo Deuji Foundation. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I jump to the Africa trade, Africa one. I think, you know, uh, this, this, you know, whether it is ECOWAS or the East African community or it is SADC, they're very, very complicated. Because, you know, uh, you know, they say, okay, free trade, SADC, we can free trade anything from each country to each country. But the question is that there's rules of origin, right? You cannot be importing something in South Africa and just doing a little bit of value addition and then exporting it and getting access free into Malawi or access, and where you know there's that specific raw material and specific industry in Malawi. So, so what is happening, I believe, you know, the way we are moving forward is a lot more protectionism, one. Two, in, in East Africa, we have the East African community. So what we did was that, you know, we said that, you know, we need a common external tariff harmonization. So anything that comes into any of these three countries, it will be common tariffs. But then, you know, certain countries have certain commodities, so they need to protect. So let's say, for example, in Tanzania, in edible oils, Kenya doesn't have edible oils, Uganda doesn't have edible oils, so they say 0% on crude oil. But Tanzania has got sunflower, has got soya bean oil, so they want to protect their farmers. Now, if they want to protect their farmers, they're going to tax the imports. Now, if they tax the imports, there's no harmonization. So that means, Kenya and Uganda can start dumping because they are bringing in at zero, they can dump into Tanzania. So there's a further protection there. So this is just within the East African or the SADC. You still have the Comesa and then you have Africa route from Egypt to South Africa. I think, you know, this will take time uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, maturity. Mm. What was your third question? Yes. So, so I'll tell you something, access to market, you know, we are a different case. Mm. We're a case because we produce, so we have 39 industries. So Tanzania, even Coke or Pepsi or Unilever or Procter & Gamble doesn't have the distribution that we have. One, and two, if there is a specific product, because you know when you have one particular product that you are selling, it is very, very expensive to create the distribution that we have. And for us, what it is, is a pipeline that we've created, but what we do is that we white label, we buy from other producers products that we do not sell, or we also, if let's say that that is a specific product that we are targeting at a specific price range, and there's another product that comes in, we also do the distribution for them. So I don't think it would make sense for a single product business to set up the full distribution. 
So I still believe that there is room for manufacturing and you can use the current distribution model that is in the country uh, to be able to distribute your products. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Duji, for taking those questions. Can I call you Mo? Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> you know, when the question was asked, um, you know, who are you? Yes. Strip away the billions and tell us who you are. How did you grow up? I've heard that story so many times. As a good MC, you have to prepare and research all the speakers on the program. But when you said the story, it felt like hearing it for the first time. And what that says to me, and certainly what I hope it says to you, is that never underestimate the curiosity and the bewilderment of hungry young people. And as you leave this event, I want to encourage you to, you know, someone spoke about you spending 100 hours a week on work, to take two of those hours and go through um, this magazine that chronicles 120 brave, bold entrepreneurs, innovators, creatives, and sportsmen. See which ones need you to land a voice to causes that are important to them, that they are championing in their communities. Who needs partnership? Who needs access to capital? Who's in a community that you service? Who could you partner with in meaningful ways to ensure that this conversation doesn't end here, the impact that you've had that's palpable, where so many young people want to continue to ask you questions. This is something that continues beyond um, this event. And, and, and I want to also tell you that this event has been about stories, and you mentioned how much you love stories when you were responding. This event has been about celebrating 120 young people and digging deep into their why. We had a couple of entrepreneurs coming up on stage and speaking about painful stories, surviving autoimmune disease to go on and start solar companies that are operating in some of the uh, you know, most disparaged countries in the world in Sierra Leone uh, and Tabi Singh, uh, Ugandan kickboxer Patricia was sitting in the front row and these are some of the people who ha have really shown us that it's the why, it's the painful moments, it's the strife that must be a motivator. But this event has also been about validation. I think let's not underestimate what it means for Forbes Africa to say you are an under 30. Let's not underestimate what it means for so many people who've come here with ideas that for a long time seemed quirky or seemed like they don't make sense within their specific family, within their specific friendship group, for what they studied or what their parents hoped for when they set out to, to go into university or when they set out in corporate and then left and then started their own business. Speaking for myself personally, I sit at the table with corporates, with SMEs, with wealthy individuals like yourselves, and I try to restructure their 1% uh, net profit that's invested into CSI and see how we can make that transformative. But sitting at that table meant starting with something that for a long time didn't have validation, didn't have credibility. So this event has been immensely powerful for all of us, and for you sitting here to acknowledge the questions the way you did, to give a face to the people who you spoke, I saw you trying to see the faces of the people who are asking you questions, is immensely important, not only for who we are right now on the stage, but for who we become in the future. Thank you so much for giving yourself. I hope that what you've said is going to create billion, uh, billionaires in this room, billionaires who are ethical in this room, billionaires with a passion for people in this room, billionaires who are going to transform lives. And as you take your seat, I'm just going to ask everyone to please stand up and give you a huge round of applause to say thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.